सब्सक्राइब टू आवर यूट्यूब चैनल एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन सो दैट यू नेवर मिस एनी वीडियो लेसन फ्रॉम राउज आई स्टडी सर्कल हेलो एंड वेलकम टू डेली न्यूज सिंप्लीफाइड एंड एनालिसिस ऑफ द हिंदी न्यूज पेपर फ्रॉम यूपीएससी परसपेक्टिव टूडे वी विल डिस्कस द डेली एडिशन ऑफ द हिंदी न्यूज पेपर डेटेड फोर्थ मार्च टू एंड द आर्टिकल्स दैट वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस आर डिस्प्लेड ऑन योर स्क्रीन सो लेट स्टार्ट द डिस्कशन This article on page number talks about the failure of the international order to avoid the Ukrainian crisis. In this line the authors have highlighted that the Ukrainian crisis has highlighted the flaws in the current international order that is the international order which was created after the second world war in the form of United Nations and also the international economic system which is represented by the World Bank, International Monetary Fund IMF as well as the World Trade Organization. In this line in the DNS of 23rd February 2022 we have discussed about the various aspects of the Ukrainian crisis in this discussion on 23rd February we talked about the different dimensions of what is leading to the Ukrainian crisis and we are aware that a war has started in the Europe in which Russia has attacked Ukraine in this we analyzed why Russia considered Ukraine as a security threat to itself and this was mainly because of the nato's expansionism and also the independence that was claimed by two regions in the southeastern part of ukraine that is donetsk as well as luhansk however in this discussion we will focus more on the issues associated with the un system that have been exposed by the ukrainian crisis in order to understand the issue related to ukrainian crisis and various associated issues you can always go through the dns of 23rd february but in this discussion we'll focus more on the issues that have been exposed in the international system or the international order by the current ukrainian crisis so let us look at this issue in detail now now the present international order was created after the second world war in which the united nations was formed In this line you might be aware that after the first world war league of nations was created however that failed miserably and it led to the second world war and after the end of second world war the united nations was created and this is known to be representing the international order that was created after the second world war with this particular objective that is the un system was created as an intergovernmental organization that aimed at maintaining international peace security developing friendly relations among the nations achieving international cooperations and it wanted to act as a center for harmonizing the actions of the nations however the un system has failed in the past in order to maintain the peace and security and to avoid a war however one of the biggest achievements of the un system till now was that it clearly avoided the third world war however the present crisis that we are witnessing in the europe in the form of ukrainian crisis where russia has attacked ukraine clearly exposes the functioning of the un system because this is the system which was misutilized and not followed by the powerful nations and which has led to the present crisis that is happening in the europe in the form of ukrainian crisis now besides the objective of maintaining international peace and security other universal institutions were also created in order to usher in an era of sustainable development and to achieve this aim of sustainable development international institutions like world bank international monetary fund as well as the world trade organizations were created and this you can say represented the economic order that was created to bring about sustainable development at a global level however both these have faced challenges and have faced issues in the past and in the present times also these are facing challenges let us look at some of these challenges that are being faced by the un system now if you look at the functioning of the un system and the challenges faced by the un system it was exposed right after the end of the second world war and the creation of the united nations system now we are not getting into the world history part of this but if you look at the cold war period the first challenge to the un system itself was posed by the confrontation that started between ussr and usa on the opposite sides and which was famously called as the cold war that is the cold war's creation or the cold war's outplay itself represented a challenge to the un system because rivalries and alliances were created based on ideologies of usa led capitalist system and the erstwhile ussr led the communist system and this kind of creation of two camps itself posed challenges to the un system because many a times both these camps were on the verge of war now in this line one of the examples of or the peak of the cold war which threatened the international security was the cuban missile crisis however in 1990s 
the USSR got disintegrated and that was seen as the end of the Cold War. A symbolic representation of the end of the Cold War was the fall of the Berlin Wall which represented the division between the USSR led camps as well as the USA led camp because Germany was divided into two after the Second World War in which the East Germany was controlled by the erstwhile USSR while the West Germany was controlled by the USA led capitalist camp. However, in 1989 this Berlin Wall was brought down and associated with it was the disintegration of the erstwhile USSR. So this was seen as the end of the Cold War. Further, we all are aware that during the Cold War period, military alliances were created and these alliances were the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which was supported by the West Camp, that is by the USA and the Western European powers, while as opposite to the NATO, Warsaw Pact was created by the USSR-led countries. And when the Cold War came to an end, the Warsaw Pact, which was led by the erstwhile USSR, also came to an end. But when the Warsaw Camp ended after the end of the Cold War, the NATO did not come to an end. And at the same time, NATO, which was led by the United States of America, kept on expanding its membership, which was resented by the Russia. And clearly, NATO's expansionism can be seen in the form of the membership that has been expanded of the NATO in the form of membership that has been provided to some of the erstwhile republics which were part of the erstwhile USSR, for example, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, etc. In this line, Ukraine was also being lured by the NATO for its membership. However, this was resented by the Russia and this has led to the current crisis in the Ukraine. In this line, NATO and the US kept following the policy of containing Russia despite the end of the Cold War, despite the assurances that were provided by the US and the UK of not expanding NATO's membership after the end of the Cold War. But despite that, the membership has kept on increasing and now the borders of the NATO countries have directly reached to the borders of Russia and this has threatened the security position of the Russia. So clearly, even after the end of the Cold War, the challenges to the UN system have not ended. In this line, if you look at the Minsk agreement related to the Ukrainian crisis, which was brought about to bring a ceasefire, this Minsk agreement was endorsed by the UN Security Council. However, despite UNSC's endorsement, it was not implemented on the ground which clearly highlights that this non-implementation of the Minsk agreement led to the escalation of the crisis, which has led to the present attack by Russia. This means that the UNSC failed to stop Russia from attacking the Ukraine, despite UNSC endorsing the Minsk agreement and associated ceasefire, which was finalized during this Minsk agreement. Now, this clearly highlights that the present Ukrainian crisis is a violation of the Charter of the United Nations. In this line, the violation of territorial integrity of the states and sovereignty of the states is one of the principles that binds the United Nations. However, this principle has been misused or has not been adhered to by the superpowers who are members of the United Nations Security Council. In this line, we are aware that Russia has vetoed the resolution on Ukraine. In this line, it is not just Russia which has vetoed the Ukrainian crisis. Earlier also, US also has vetoed based on their personal interest. That is, US had vetoed a resolution which condemned Israel's activities in the occupied territories in the Palestinian region. In this line, the veto power has been misused by the permanent five members of the UN Security Council, represented by the United States, Russia, United Kingdom, France and China. That is, the veto power has been used by the P5 members based on their personal interests and not based on the principles enshrined in the UN Charter. That is, the principles that were forwarded by the UN system to bring about international peace and security were themselves not adopted or accepted by the permanent five members which were seen to be responsible for implementing the UN Charter in the first place. But that has not happened. At this point, it needs to be highlighted that the Russian veto against resolution on Ukraine and the US's veto against Israel are not just the present examples of violation of the Charter of the United Nations. In the past also, during the Cold War, both the superpowers US and Russia had misused this veto power, which was not in line with the Charter of the United Nations. Now that is a part of world history, you can always go to the world history and look at the instances of the failure of the UN Security Council 
in following the charter of the United Nations. But we are presently concerned with the Ukrainian crisis. Now, not just the UN Security Council and the mandate of the UN to bring about international peace and security has seen challenges, the international economic system itself has also seen the challenges. So in the background of the Russian attack on the Ukraine, we are witnessing that sanctions are being imposed against the Russia. However, these sanctions themselves have various loopholes. That is, even inside these sanctions, the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia, the energy exports from Russia are not forbidden. This is because the European countries or the West European countries in the form of Germany and France, they are dependent on import of oil and gas from Russia. Further, if the energy sector is sanctioned, it will lead to rise in the international crude oil prices, which will be against the interest of the United States itself. That is why energy exports have been kept out of the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia. Further, these economic sanctions are being used as a weapon to threaten the international economic system. So the impact of the economic sanctions will not just be on Russia, but it will also be on the international economic system. And that will have implications on some of the underdeveloped and the developing countries in the form of rise in the crude oil prices and various other associated issues. Further, another important thing about the sanctions that are being imposed is that they are unilateral sanctions that are being imposed by the US and the West European countries. And these sanctions are not supported by the UN Security Council. That itself says that the countries are not following the mandate of the UN Charter. That is why the global order that was created after the Second World War is witnessing challenges which are clearly visible in the form of Ukrainian crisis. Further, if you look at the international economic system, it is not just the Ukrainian crisis that has exposed these challenges, but even during the COVID-19 pandemic, the world could not come to consensus, especially on the case or the issue of providing waiver to the vaccine from the patents under the WTO regime. And this has clearly led to vaccine inequality, where some of the developed countries are giving booster doses to their citizens, while the underdeveloped countries of the Africa have not received single dose also at times. So this clearly exposes that the international economic order that was created after the Second World War is also facing challenges which are exposed by the Ukrainian crisis, the sanctions that are being imposed on Russia, which do not have the endorsement of the UNSC, as well as the COVID crisis and the issue of waiver of the COVID-19 vaccines. Further, another issue that has been exposed because of the Ukrainian crisis is the issue of nuclear disarmament. So we all are aware that one of the mandate of the UN Charter was keeping or bringing about international or maintaining international peace and security. And associated with the maintenance of international peace and security was the purpose of nuclear disarmament because nuclear weapons are seen as a threat to the international peace and security. And we have seen the worst impacts of the nuclear arms in the case of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. However, in the present context, in the context of the Ukrainian crisis, a message is being sent that nuclear weapons can guarantee security despite the UNSC's take on the nuclear weapons. Now, if you look at the case of Iran and North Korea, these have faced sanctions because of the development of the nuclear weapons. However, despite these development of the nuclear weapons, and facing sanctions, these countries have till now been only isolated and they have not faced war till now. However, as compared to these two countries, countries like Ukraine and Libya, which gave up their nuclear weapons back in 1990s, have been invaded. So this clearly shows that the nuclear weapons are emerging as a, one of the important tools for national security. Further, the nuclear weapon states themselves have derailed the negotiations on nuclear disarmament. In this line, if you look at the functioning of the UN system, the nations which have the control of the nuclear weapons have brought out a nuclear non-proliferation treaty outside the UN system. And through the formation of this non-proliferation treaty or the NPT, the nuclear weapon states have given themselves the right to have nuclear weapons in perpetuity while non-nuclear weapon countries will have to be dependent on guarantees of protection that will be provided by these nuclear weapon states. So this in itself shows that the NPT treaty is discriminatory in nature. In this line, we all are aware that India, despite being a responsible nuclear nation, is not being provided the membership of the NPT. And in this backdrop, because of such actions that have been taken by the 
P5 members or the nuclear weapon states in the past and especially in the context of the Ukrainian crisis where Ukraine had given up its nuclear weapons and is now facing the threat of war or is under attack by Russia clearly highlights that such kind of activities or actions highlight or discourages the consensus that was created on nuclear disarmament. That is, such actions would further increase the nuclear arms race in the future because the countries which face the threat of war perpetually will start viewing the nuclear weapons as a guarantee for security. However, this is only going to lead to escalation of the nuclear arms race and threat to international peace and security. Now, in this backdrop, let us try and understand the Non-Proliferation Treaty or the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that is NPT from our prelims examination perspective and how it has created a discriminatory regime as against the objectives of the UN Charter. So if you look at the NPT, it is a multilateral treaty aimed at limiting the spread of nuclear weapons. In this line, it has three main goals. First is non-proliferation, second is disarmament and third is peaceful use of nuclear energy. In this line, this treaty of NPT defines the nuclear weapon states as those states that had manufactured and detonated a nuclear explosive device prior to 1st January 1967. Now this illogical cutoff date of 1st January 1967 has been set up in order to protect the nuclear weapon state status of the P5 members or the powerful nations which were in possession of the nuclear weapons right after the Second World War. In this line, all the other countries besides these nuclear weapon states are considered as non-nuclear weapon states. So based on this definition, only five nuclear weapon states exist presently and these are China, France, Russia, UK and United States. That is, all the permanent members of the UN Security Council are only considered as the nuclear weapon states according to the NPT treaty because it has set a very illogical date of 1st January 1967. Further, regarding the peaceful use of nuclear energy, the NPT treaty does not affect the right of the state parties to develop, produce and use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes. So the International Atomic Energy Agency verifies the non-nuclear weapon states and their compliance with the commitments under the NPT not to acquire the nuclear weapons. So this can also be one of the important facts that International Atomic Energy Agency is the one which verifies the compliance of the non-nuclear weapon states with the NPT treaty. In this line, South Sudan, India, Israel and Pakistan are outside this treaty. Now an interesting fact here is that in order to accede to the NPT treaty, the present nuclear weapon states which have not been accorded the status of the nuclear weapon states according to NPT like India and Pakistan will have to give up their nuclear weapons in order to become a member of the NPT. These countries will be required to dismantle their nuclear weapons and place their nuclear materials under the international safeguards. Now this is because an arbitrary date that is 1st January 1967 has been set up for countries to be recognized as nuclear weapon states under the NPT treaty. And if you are aware, India conducted its nuclear explosion after this cutoff date of 1st January 1967. So for nuclear weapon possessing countries which are not recognized as nuclear weapon states under the NPT, they will have to dismantle their nuclear weapons in order to accede to the NPT treaty because they cannot be given the status of nuclear weapon states now because of this arbitrary cutoff date that has been set to be declared as a nuclear weapon state. So this clearly shows that such kind of action by the P5 members is discriminatory in nature. And this discourages the international consensus on nuclear disarmament. And in the present crisis, we are witnessing that one of the P5 members, that is Russia, has attacked Ukraine because Ukraine does not possess nuclear weapons and it gave up its nuclear weapons in 1994 based on the assurances that were given by the West as well as Russia to provide security to the Ukraine. So such kind of actions by the P5 members, which has given themselves a nuclear weapon state status under the NPT, and which cannot guarantee the international peace and security of the non-nuclear weapon possessing countries clearly highlights that it will further lead to increase in the nuclear arms race in the future. Now after looking at the challenges faced by the international order that was created after the second world war 
we all are aware that UNSC has failed to implement its mandate of international peace and security or maintaining international peace and security. That is why there are talks that this is the right moment for bringing about reforms in the UNSC. In this backdrop, from our mains examination perspective, let us try and understand why are UNSC reforms required in the first place. Now, the first reason to bring about the UNSC reforms is that the geopolitical situation has changed considerably since the Second World War. And if you look at the formation of the UN Security Council, it was created by the victors of the Second World War, that is allied powers that were part of the Second World War and who had won the Second World War. So it can be seen as a discriminatory treaty that was imposed by the victors of the Second World War on the global level. That is why, despite a change in the geopolitical situation in the present times, the UNSC has relatively changed very little. Further, the UNSC reforms have been long overdue. That is, no major change has been witnessed in the structure of the UNSC, despite the number of UN members has increased from initially 113 to presently 193. If you look at the economic and the geographical representation of the countries at the UNSC, it is inequitable. That is, Africa, Latin America and emerging powers like India and Germany do not have a representation in the permanent membership of the UNSC. Further, there has been crisis of legitimacy and credibility of the United Nations Security Council, which was witnessed in the case of Libya, the Iran nuclear deal, Afghanistan, war on terror, as well as the present Ukrainian crisis. Further, the issue of arms race as well as nuclear weapon proliferation has not witnessed any progress. This is because this is one of the spheres which is dominated by the P5 members which we have seen in the case of NPT treaty which provides a nuclear weapon state status to only the permanent five members of the UN Security Council. Also it has been said that there is north-south divide and the UNSC is dominated by the developed nations. Further in the context of the emerging issues like cyber warfare, international terrorism etc. the UNSC has not been able to control these issues. Also, there are threats of bioterrorism which were exposed in the terms of COVID-19 and, and speculations that the COVID virus might have been used as a bioweapon and might have leaked from the Wuhan laboratory. Further, we all are aware that the veto power has been misused by the P5 members for their narrow national interests. In this context, let us look at what are the areas of reform for the UN Security Council. So if you look at the areas of reform, first is that the membership of the UNSC should be expanded. So the first area of reform is expanding the permanent membership to include the present day reality and also making it more representative. Second is there has to be a reform in the use of or the power of veto that has been provided. Further, even if the permanent membership of the UN Security Council is expanded, there is still disagreement on whether the new members that will be incorporated into the permanent membership should be provided with veto power or not. And this has been seen as one of the obstacle to Security Council reform or the UN Security Council reform. Third is related to the decision making. And because of the controversial nature of the veto power that we have seen in the case of Ukrainian crisis, also in the past instances, where the superpowers or the permanent five have misused their position in the UN Security Council and have misused the powers of veto, some experts have called for removing the veto power altogether and moving towards a more consensus-driven decision-making. There have been also talks about improving the Security Council and the UN General Assembly relationship. In this line, we are aware that when the resolution against the Ukraine failed at the UN Security Council, a resolution was forwarded in the UN General Assembly. However, UN General Assembly, which is far more representative, does not hold or wield any power as compared to the UN Security Council. So in this line, there have been talks about improving the quality of interaction between the UN Security Council and the UN General Assembly. And this would provide the Council or the UN Security Council with additional information and insights to inform its work. In this line, there have been suggestions that G4 countries like India, Germany, Brazil should be included as permanent members of the UN Security Council. So these are few suggestions regarding the areas of reform and also we have seen why the UN Security Council needs reforms. This brings us to next important issue as to the present case of the UNSC resolution that was brought against Russia and also what was India's stand 
and the analysis of India's stand of abstention from the resolution or abstention from voting against the UNSC resolution against Russia. So in this line, the UNSC resolution was brought out against Russia for its attack on Ukraine. In this line, this resolution was moved by another P5 member that is United States as well as Albania. Now this resolution reaffirmed its commitment to sovereignty, independence, unity and territorial integrity of the Ukraine. And it asked Russia to immediately cease its military operation against Ukraine. Further, it also asked Russia to reverse its decision related to the status of Donetsk and Luhansk regions of the Ukraine. In this line, you might be aware that Russia has recognized the independence of Donetsk and Luhansk in the southeastern part of Ukraine as independent republics. So in this line, the UNSC resolution talked about or asked Russia to reverse its decisions of recognizing these two territories as independent republics. In this line, India has abstained from voting against or in favor of this resolution, while Russia used its veto power so that this UNSC resolution does not get accepted and implemented on the ground. So besides India, China also chose to abstain from voting. And we all are aware that for a resolution to be passed, all the permanent members of the Security Council should either vote or some of them might abstain, but there should not be any veto against such resolution. But because Russia has vetoed, the resolution could not be passed. In this line, we all are aware that India has been maintaining a balance between West, that is the US-led countries, as well as Russia. And in the past also, on a procedural vote on the issue of Ukraine at the UNSC, India had abstained from voting. India's position back then was about addressing the legitimate security concerns of Russia, which highlighted a tilt towards Russia. But principally, India abstained from voting. This shows the neutrality that India reflected at the international level. So what was the justification or what were the reasons that were provided by India for abstaining from this vote? Let us look at the reasons. In this line, India stated that it was deeply disturbed by the recent turn of events in Ukraine. Also, India reiterated the appeal for cessation of violence. Further, on the issue of sovereignty and territorial integrity, which is one of the principles of the UN Charter, India said that the contemporary global order has been built on the UN Charter, international law, and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity of the states. And all member states need to honor these principles in finding a constructive way forward. And at the end, India advocated diplomacy, that is, dialogue is the only answer to settling differences and not the violence. So in principle, India talked about respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity as well as cessation of violence and advocated diplomacy. However, in this context, it abstained from voting. So let us look at or analyze India's decision of abstaining from voting against the UNSC resolution against Russia. Let us look at why India did it and what are the issues or aspects related to India's decision of abstaining from the UNSC vote. So in this line, it has been said that India's abstention has reflected its national interest. This is because India has had strategic relationship with Russia in the past. We all are aware that Russia had supported India in case of India-Pakistan war in 1971. Further, India is also wary of the ever-growing closeness between Russia and China. That is why, in order to pursue its national interest, India has abstained from voting against the resolution against Russia at the UN Security Council. Further, we are aware that Russia is one of the important defense partners of India. And that is why India did not want to threaten its relationship with Russia, which could have had far-reaching consequences on the security of India because Russia is one of the important defense partners and in this line, the highest imports of defense into India are provided by Russia. However, despite abstention, there have been talks that India highlighted its principled belief in the UN Charter system because we have talked about maintaining sovereignty and territorial integrity of the states. Also, in the reasoning, we have provided that there should be cessation of violence and at the same time, India advocated the path of diplomacy. So by advocating the upholding of the principles of the UN Charter and from abstaining from the voting, India has struck a balance between the principles of UN system, 
or the belief in the principles of the UN system and at the same time the pragmatic considerations of its foreign policy in terms of its relations with Russia. Further, if you look at the present global order, there are three main powers that is United States of America, Russia and China. And given India's rivalry with China, while other two countries that is Russia and US being its strategic partners, India had to remain neutral in the conflict. And in case of a conflict between these two strategic partners that is US and Russia, India should have taken a stand only when this posed a threat to India's security in the South Asia or the Indian Ocean region which is of immediate neighborhood in India and also is related to India's security concerns. That is why this choice of being neutral has been said to be one of the pragmatic considerations of India for pursuing its foreign policy goals. Further, it has been said that by abstaining, India has kept the space for dialogue and diplomacy open without taking sides. In this line, it has been said that such neutral stand can pave the way for India playing a key role in getting all the parties to the negotiating table because of the traditional relationship that India has with Russia, while India has been allying with countries like United States of America, where US is also emerging as one of the strategic partners of India. Plus, another P5 member, that is France, is also one of the important partners of India. So, because India has good relations with both the sides, that is US as well as France and with Russia and because India has adopted a neutral stand, India can play a very important part in getting all the parties to the negotiating table in the future. However, there have been criticisms also, that is its position has been called by experts as being contrary to its aspiration of being a leading power. And it has been said that to be a leading power, India will have to take clear position on a conflict that threatens global security. And in this line, India's abstention can also be read as a tacit support to the aggressive transgressions by a more powerful neighbor over a weaker one. And such kind of stand of India, where India has not taken a clear stand on Russia, which is one of the powerful country, which has taken aggressive steps against Ukraine, which is a smaller country as compared to Russia. This threatens India's image in India's neighborhood also. Because if you look at India's position in South Asia, it is not structurally symmetric. And India is already viewed by its neighboring countries as being a big brother in South Asia. That is, India is dominating the smaller countries of the South Asia. So that is already the image with which India is seen in the South Asian neighborhood. So that is why such kind of strand of neutrality and not taking a clear stand against the aggression by a more powerful country against a weaker country might further hamper India's image as being a big brother in the South Asia. So these are the contrary opinions or these are the opinions that have been highlighted by the experts which impact India's image because of the neutral stand that India has taken at the UN Security Council resolution against Russia. Now this brings us to another important issue that is what would be the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on India. In this line, we all are aware that India has traditionally had close ties with Russia or the erstwhile USSR also. In this line, we are aware that India has been tilting towards the United States of America of late because of the formation of the Quad and focus of China on the Indo-Pacific as well as India on the Indo-Pacific in order to deter the aggressive maneuvers of China. Further, Russia is a major defense supplier of India. But the current position of Russia on Ukraine and the sanctions that are being imposed by the West on Russia is further strengthening the Sino-Russian partnership or the China-Russia partnership. And if this China-Russia axis is further concretized, it might curtail Russia's ability to support India in case of a conflict between India and China. So this is one of the issues that India can face because of the growing closeness between Russia and China. Also, we are aware that India is right now indulged in important defense deals with Russia a major one is the S-400 missile system. And in this, we already are aware that India has been getting waiver under the Katsa law of United States of America. However, because of this present escalation of the crisis in the Ukraine and Russia attacking Ukraine and the sanctions being imposed by the United States of America on Russia, this might have impact on India not getting a waiver in the near future related to its S-400D. Further, other defense supplies can also be affected because of the economic sanctions that are being imposed. 
and because of the curtailed defense supplies, it will impact India's ability to respond to China because defense imports are one of the important aspects of India's security in the South Asia and its immediate neighborhood, especially in the context of the threat that is posed by Pakistan and China. Also, another major issue that has emerged is that it diverts the attention of the United States of America and the European powers from the Indo-Pacific region because they will now be focusing more on their immediate neighborhood and the crisis that is happening in Europe, which has till now remained peaceful since the Second World War. But this escalation of crisis in Ukraine and attack by Russia on Ukraine has brought Europe once again into focus. That is why the focus of US and Europe will now be diverted from the Indo-Pacific, although a Quad meeting has taken place and all the countries have assured each other's partnership in the Indo-Pacific, but still the main focus would be on the Europe because of the war that has broken out in the European territory. And at the same time, because of escalation in the crude oil prices, it might impact India's energy security because we are aware that India is usually dependent on import of crude oil from the West Asian countries. And if the prices of the international crude oil increase, this might impact India's energy security and in turn impact India's economic activity and balance of payment in the near future. So these are different dimensions of the Ukrainian crisis in terms of the challenges it poses to the UN system. We have seen that plus the challenges that are posed to the international economic order that was created after the Second World War. Also, we looked at the dimensions of reforms of the UN Security Council and also what was India's stand and we analyzed the India stand also. And at last, we looked at the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on India. So these are various dimensions from the exam perspective plus non-proliferation treaty from prelims perspective. With this, we conclude today's discussion and this is the question for the day.